Welcome to Short Takes on Geography with Dr. Lisa Benton Short, Professor of Geography at the George Washington University and Chief Reader of Advanced Placement Human Geography. Join us as Dr. Short interviews Dr. Parag Khanna, geostrategist, world traveler, and best-selling author, discussing central concepts in the AP Human Geography curriculum through the lens of his new book, Move, The Forces Uprooting Us. This discussion series is brought to you by the American Geographical Society, the foremost champion of geography for the benefit of society since 1851. And now, over to Dr. Lisa Benton Short. Welcome back, geographers. I'm Lisa Benton Short here with Parag Khanna, and we are putting it all together, our, our conversations around AP Human Geography and how a geographic perspective helps us understand so much of what's happening in the world. We've had these great conversations that have covered the different units in AP Human Geography, and we wanna kind of integrate it all in kind of a bigger picture conversation. So, you know, AP Human Geography, I get to say it, um, is one of the fastest growing AP subjects. And uh, we hope in 2022, about 250,000 students will be taking the AP Human Geography exam. And the point of taking the course isn't so much about taking the exam, the point of the course is to learn how to think about things from a geographic perspective. And we sure hope that over the course of your time uh, taking this course, you have become pretty adept at seeing and understanding spatial patterns and distribution, of thinking about scale of analysis, of really appreciating the integrated and interconnected nature of population, culture, agriculture, politics, urbanization, and economics. Um, so in this conversation, what I wanna do is to kind of allow us to think about some of these deeper issues like, you know, what does the future look like? What role will North America or Europe or Sub-Saharan Africa or South America play in a complex planetary system, um, especially one that is grappling with climate change? So what kinds of geographies are gonna be most suitable for, um, for us to imagine in a future, Parag? Can we achieve sustainability? Can we create a more just future? What does the future look like from your perspective? Oh, those are the amazing questions. And uh, it is, like you say, a synthesis, a culmination of all of these uh, previous conversations we've been having. And I want to echo, start by echoing one thing you said, which is that it's a complex planetary system. And another way of saying that is that, you know, it's globalization. And I want to kind of step back and remind people that, you know, for all of the pessimism that there is today about nationalism and borders and retrenchment, actually in many ways, our journey into this global civilization has actually just begun. And you can almost go back and document this historically through what I call the five stages of globalization. You know, when the first phase of globalization, the Silk Roads of a thousand years ago was interregional, but it wasn't global right, wasn't truly global. Then you had European colonialism for several centuries, and much of the world did fall under the authority of European powers, but not the entire world. And it still wasn't one integrated global system. It was individual European empires creating their own competing spheres of influence around the world. The Industrial Revolution, you had internal shifts in terms of who's who the powers are in the world within Western civilization. The United States, of course, rose to be a global superpower at this point in time. And one Asian power, Japan, started to rise up in the early uh, 20th century. But you didn't have one global order, one global set of rules, you know, and one sort of uh, a playing field, if you will. And even then, you know, after the devastation of World War II, we started to have, you know, independence for countries. We finally had a world of sovereign nations, actually at this phase, right? Uh, coming out of World War II, we created dozens and dozens of countries. The United Nations was founded. But when you look at the structure of power and who called the shots 
and who dominated the world economy, it was still a few key powers. And only at the end, after the end of uh, you know, the late Cold War into the 1980s and 90s, that's when you finally had the rise of China. And India is a bit slower than China in that development. So you really didn't have a global system. You just, we call these countries emerging markets. So now I bring you to the present, right? What I call total globalization, because this is a world in which you have every single region, every single continent matters. They're important. They're part of a global system. They can trade with, connect with, exchange with any other part of the world through technology, through supply chains, through infrastructure. And they're doing so on their own terms, right? There isn't one power saying, I get to tell everyone what to do, and I determine who gets to trade and exchange with whom. We have never, ever lived in a world like that. And we're doing it on the back, partially, of these latest technologies. Now, when we've, we've talked about technology, Lisa, and technological eras that last for hundreds of years, well, the internet was, you know, the, the World Wide Web went live in 1989, the same year that the Berlin Wall fell. We are only 30 years into an era that will last for centuries. So I cannot support the idea that we're living in a world that's becoming increasingly fragmented, when in fact, for the first time in human history, we actually can say that we are actually living within one connected civilization. And that's part of what is so amazing about being a young person at this moment in time. You're in the earliest, earliest moments of this total globalization, the likes of which we haven't really experienced in the in the rapid and truly global uh, way that we are today. And, and I'll just emphasize again, you know, building on the World Wide Web, all of the technologies that are reshaping just the connections between geographies, but how we relate to geography and how we relate to each other across geography, because there is now this global brain of the internet that each of us is plugged into and connected to. And therefore our social identity um, is so much more of a factor in human geography. Human geography of the past might have been just what is your eth ethnic identity? What is your racial identity? What is the lo your location and your country of nationality telling us about you? But today you can plug into so many parts of the global brain, connect with so many different constituencies and communities and define yourself far, far beyond the place where you are. In fact, you may never physically move from the place where you are, but your social geography, your psychological geography, your communities that, with which you affiliate can actually be so diverse given the fact that we spend so much time, you know, living in a way and conducting our lives in cyberspace. And that's why, you know, going back to uh, something you said, Lisa, in an earlier um, uh, unit, there's just a whole new vocabulary, cloud communities, social network analysis, uh, social physics, and so on. And this really defies our traditional geographically based understanding of what constitutes community and identity because it was always tied to place. But in cyberspace, place has a very different uh, meaning. So to me, that's just some of the stuff that lies at the frontier and the future of human geography when seen through uh, the lens of, uh, of technology. But how, how do you see it as we time travel into the future of human geography? Well, travel is at the heart of what geographers do, right? Uh, we explore the world. Um, and in fact, I'm kind of um, reminded of a quote from Mark Twain, who said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. So Parag, what does, what does it mean to travel? How can 
a geographic perspective? How do geographers, um, you know, shift and uh, deal with this kind of new uh, fourth industrial revolution, these new multiple identities? Uh, what's the role of travel in all of this? Well, travel, you know, I love that quote by, uh, by Mark Twain, of course, as much as, as you do. It's uh, something I print out and keep uh, in my desk drawer, <laughs> among, among others. And travel has certainly defined uh, my life because I think when you just study geography, you know about a place, you know the facts and the figures. When you go to a place, you get a sense of it and you can start to identify with it. And it can become part of your identity. My first and foremost identity is most certainly as a, a traveler because I can't anymore after traveling so much pick one place and say that place defines me. It is the sum of all of those places that I've, I've traveled to. And that's a major inflection point in terms of your relationship to geography that, that develops and evolves uh, the more and more that, that you travel. And of course, it leads you to appreciate, again, these many layers of geography. When you go to a place, you don't just see it as uh, you know one line on the map or another. You think about it in terms of those layers that we discussed at the beginning. You see the physical geography because you've driven around. You see the, the political geography of boundaries. You see the functional geography of the cities and the infrastructure. And then you appreciate the diversity of all the peoples. So by traveling, you just you stop viewing layers of geography as being rigidly distinct, but as really uh, fusing together. And one of the concepts that go, goes back to 19th century geographic thought that I think will become more and more important as we tie together all of these layers and trends is continentalism. You know, it's really thinking about our geography beyond our national boundaries. And again, evolving beyond the maps that we're accustomed to using that are mostly political. And this is just one example of that. This is a map that I like to call the North American Union. And we don't actually have a North American Union like the European Union. But when you map out our connectivity across the borders with Mexico and with Canada, and if you were to look at the flows of people, let's remember that on this map, and I think it's something we can be proud of, Lisa, um, the two busiest border crossings, you know, voluntary, free, um, you know, uh, uh, in, ter in terms of uh, the... Um, the open nature, the number of checkpoints and the number of people crossing every year. On the planet Earth, our two borders are the busiest, 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 most, most traffic borders on Earth by far, by far, by far, by far. And that is a real reflection of the depth of peace that we've achieved in North America at a continental scale. So Americans need to start thinking of ourselves as North Americans, not just Americans. And you can grasp that and appreciate it and feel it by traveling around and by mapping uh, the connectivity. And I'll have uh, you know, one more forecast, which is um, ties together so many of the themes that we've talked about. And it's this animation here that brings in the climate dimension of all of this. And a red zone on this map doesn't mean it's a place that you know, no one can live, but it does mean that it's less and less suitable uh, for the kind of life that we've been accustomed to as, we, as climate change accelerates, if it does accelerate. And the question that you know, I, I raise is the one that we discussed at the very beginning, which is how are we going to realign our natural geography, our political geography, our functional geography, and our, and our uh, human geography to cope with the complexity of today's world, to cope with political volatility, to cope with economic crises, technological disruptions and climate change, all at the same time. Because I think you and I have emphasized throughout what a, what a wondrous period of time and, and an era this is for people to be alive, especially young people, whether it is the demographic inflection points or the technological wonders, but it's also a world full of risk. And in the end, it is up to today's young people to decide how we design 
the geography of the future, design our own geography, make our own maps to uh, embrace the opportunities, to adapt to the risks and to build a better future, to design a better future. And that is the challenge that lies ahead. So here you have a final image with you know, no borders at all, but simply a reflection of you know, in our, our fundamental essence going back millions of years as a species, hundreds of thousands of, year, of years as migratory nomadic spe a species that we are and asking where should we be, where should we live, how will we live together? And those are some of the most important questions of human geography. Well, I can't think of uh, a more interesting way to end our conversation than with that image, because it really does challenge us to rethink uh, our connections, our interdependence with each other, uh, the physical world, the, the, you know, the, the physical geography of our planet. Um, and I just really want to thank you so much for sharing so much of what you've been thinking about for many years now with our AP Human Geography students. So thank you so much. And do you have a last charge to our AP Human Geography students? Well, first of all, I wanna thank you, Lisa. You're such an amazing teacher and I've learned so much through these uh, interactions and dialogues. And I hope these conversations uh, add a spark of life in addition to all of the great materials that uh, the students are learning and studying in AP Human Geography. So thank you so much for making me part of this. And I guess my final statement is geography is what you make of it. And uh, that's the phrase, that's the bumper sticker that I want AP Human Geography students to take away. And remember, uh, long beyond this course and into, into your future. Absolutely. I think you said it best. Human geography is more important than ever. And I am so delighted that we had this opportunity to have a conversation. You're just such a forward, uh, futuristic thinker. And I know that many of much of what we've talked about over this, these conversations um, are going to inspire a lot of uh, future geographers. So thank you so much. And for all the students out there, just keep loving and studying geography and make sure you get out and travel the world. Thank you for joining us for this segment of Short Takes on Geography with Dr. Lisa Benton Short. Tune in for this and more great geography teaching resources at americangeo.org. Until next time.